Welcome everybody. It's fantastic to see uh, everybody here for this second series of Light at the End of the Tunnel. My name is Naomi Stead. I'm a professor of architecture at Monash University and the second series of Light at the End of the Tunnel is a collaboration between Parla and the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne, who is the Zoom host. Um, as always, we begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country across Australia's many nations and recognising their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to the Indigenous Australians, the second series of Light at the End of the Tunnel. Um, as some, many of you know, we did 30 of them last year, I believe. Was it 30, Justine? It was 30. It was 30. Uh, and last year, of course, was a pretty torrid year and the reason why we felt uh, that light at the end of the tunnel was needed was because we were trying to share lessons, um, advice, assistance, um, and also to look forward to how architecture as a profession, a discipline and a practice was being affected by the pandemic and how it would come out the other end. Of course, we didn't expect the tunnel to be so long and we haven't come out the other end yet. Uh, although of course, you know, what the experience we're having this year is quite different from last year. Uh, so Justine and I decided just recently, I think last week or the week before, that we would revive the series because we felt there was still a need for it. And obviously at the time we were particularly thinking of our friends in New South Wales suffering, you know, um, not a great situation right now, but of course Melbourne is also back in lockdown as is Canberra as of today. And uh, it looks to be that this will how it will be, this is how it will be for many of us for much of the rest of the year. So, um, this week, our guests are Tiwa Gill and Sarah Bennett, two Melbourne-based pr practitioners speaking on the subject of lessons from the lockdown. The format is Q&A style. It's meant to be informal but informative. So uh, Justine and I will ask questions and keep things flowing, but we also take questions from the floor throughout in the chat. Also, please feel free to add your own observations and experiences into the chat. Um, it doesn't have to be a question, it can be an observation. And we find that that kind of parallel narrative is really, really interesting. So feel free. Justine. Yes, Naomi, thank you very much. Um, and hello everyone, and it's really great to be back. Um, so we're delighted to have Tiwa and Sarah with us today. Uh, many of you will know Tiwa from sessions last year, um, where she did some wonderful, had some wonderful conversations. Um, and she's a great friend to Paula and a fantastic contributor to the community and the broader profession. Uh, Tiwa's studio and HR manager at Grimshaw here in Melbourne. Uh, she's had a long experience in architectural studio management, working closely with directors and employees of several practices. Um, her interest lies in working with others to implement change, changes in employee participation and workplace culture, and she's a strong advocate for an inclusive and diverse workplace. We're also really thrilled to have Sarah here with us for the, her first time at speaking at a parlor event, and we hope that that will be the first of many. Um, <laughs> Sarah is a director at Six Degrees Architects with a focus in the company on finance and business strategy, and she's got a background in public relations. Her drive comes from supporting her peers every day to make the Melbourne she loves a more sustainable, respectful and bold place to be with spaces and opportunities created for people to thrive. Now, I know this about them because they both did excellent <laughs> Marion's List entries and I just encourage everyone on this call to... Um, to do, uh, to do their Marion's List entry, but I also think they're both, those two are both masterclasses in how you write a good one. So thank you to both of you. So welcome Tiwa and Sarah. Um, and as Naomi said, we're interested in canvassing the lessons and insights that we've garnered from experiences during um, this very strange and very long time. And we just wanted to start by just asking both of you, Sarah and Tiwa, how are you going? <laughs> There are things in your world. Um, that's a good big first question, Justine. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Ty, I don't want to jump in too much. I think I have a tendency to do that. Thank but um, Sarah. we were having a little chat just before, um, just before starting, even just Justine, yourself, and I, about this tunnel that we're talking about and the light at the end of it, and how we're we don't even know if we're three quarters of the way through it yet. We don't, it's like we're running a marathon and we don't know when that finish line is. Um, but we have learned a lot 
over the last 18 months. So I would say personally, I'm currently going okay. And I'm hoping that that so is the company that I work for. Um, but it's been challenging. Absolutely. Very, very challenging. Mm. I, I agree, Sarah. And look, thank you everyone for joining. It's really lovely to see some familiar faces um, as I turn the pages digitally. Um, but I, I, you know, I echo your, your sentiments, Sarah. We have learned an extraordinary amount over the last you know, 12 to 18 or 15 months. Um, and I think the unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory is probably becoming more familiar even though we're still navigating the long tunnel and there is light hopefully, um, but I'm sure we'll come to that. I think just for me personally, it's, it's exhausting. Um, it's also, um, there's some really surprising moments as well, but I think, you know, I, I deal with my own kind of levels of anxiety and, and, and ways to kind of manage myself and, you know, big announcement. If anyone wants to join the Edinburgh women's cricket team, please let me know at the end of this. <laughs> um, the big plug, uh, but also just, you know, the deep care I have for everyone at the practice and also with industry. So I'm sure we'll talk about those networks and support that are out there. Um, and, you know, a huge thank you to Justine and Naomi and Susie uh, and also to Sarah as well, because I know that I can knock on their door at any time. So, I think the big umbrella message for me is that, you know, I'm, I'm going okay, um, even though it's, it's, it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. mm. I think we've all, you know, such a also big diverse range of experiences of this time too. And I think we kind of need to acknowledge that. I think even just naming my own experiences of the lockdowns are very, very different. Um, so we are interested to know, what's been learned, I guess. Um, so, and I guess the first one now that we're all, so many of us are back operating in a dispersed um, environment again, is to know what have you learned over this time about how you, how you manage people in, and projects in this kind of very, very dispersed environment? Have you, um, I think, you know, everyone scrambled 18 months ago, however long ago, God knows how long ago it was, everyone scrambled to work out how to do it. Um, and then I think in Melbourne, at least, we had a very long time of working out how to do it. And now that we're back in that lockdown again, I wonder if you might, if you've got some reflections on that. Mm. Yeah, it's been interesting just thinking about um, pre this talk today, just reflecting on what the 18 months were like and really reminding myself of how sudden it was and this sort of forced experiment of how do we work um, um, it, as a separated workforce and we had no time to think about it or prepare. Um, and obviously technology was uh, was extraordinarily convenient. I don't know where we would all be today without Zoom and Slack and um, Teams. Um, but um, I guess in terms of lesson learned for me and what I think our company's experienced is um, probably the first thing that had to happen was an emphasis on over-communication um, that was that's that was for workflow primarily, um, um, and those who were already naturally good communicators and good leaders came to the fore, and um, and unfortunately, if that wasn't the case, it was very evident. So it lifted the bar a little bit for people um, to to be really good project leaders, and for the company to be. You know, I'm not saying that um, that you know we hit our mark, but it was really important to think about how to communicate the anxieties of what was happening in the industry um, regularly without tipping it the wrong way, turning it into pure anxiety, just trying to keep a steady, a steady middle line. That was a really big challenge at the, at the start. Um, Tiwa, I don't know if you agree with that. Or if that's oh, what you're... Look, I do. I think a lot of us share the sort of same similar experiences, even though that can be diverse in other ways. I mean, as you mentioned, Sarah, where, you know, always in sort of increasingly engaging in and collaborating, you know, over mixed sort of mode platforms and then you become more adept. But I think about that over communicating and in, in that fine balance of how you don't want to burden the, the people and the team, but you also want to try and bring them along and, and ensure they're informed and, and there's a, still a sense of belonging. Because um, I think in that sort of hybrid workplace, it's so, so intrinsically um, needed. I think, and you know, I probably said this a lot of times, but 
you know, we have to work very hard at maintaining those, you know, being connected and going through our regular practice touch points. So I know it seems a bit of jargon, that sort of practice touch points, but for us includes the Monday updates, the Wednesday project updates, the Friday socials and everything in between. And that's equally as important, not just for the practice, but also for the leadership team. So they feel empowered to keep leading and, and keep engaged when they're managing their teams through a virtual environment. So it, it's extra work. Um, but I think what it really, you know, reminds us is sort of greater focus on people and the need for that sense of belonging and value. And it's, you know, it's not airy fairy stuff. It's actually, you know, really, really important that we're kind um, through all this. But I, I, you know, in terms of, you know, Sarah, you mentioned technology. That is, you know, that is absolutely what we need to do to scaffold the project teams to make sure there's, you know, access um, and, you know, those sort of platforms such as Miro that I think a lot of us use. Um, to share and collaborate design ideas and, and do design reviews. Um, I think, you know, in addition to that, you still need your structured team planning, you know, your regular, regular schedule of meetings and catch-ups. And I know there probably come more catch-ups on Zoom than we like, but it's, again, it's taking that time to give focus to your team and knowing that they have empowered to be able to perform their role and that you'll know what, and you know what they're doing. That's really important. And, Obviously, larger teams have much more connection, probably in the sense that they've got more people to talk to. And we've got to remember those in smaller project teams might only be working with one other person. So then how do you bring them into the rest of the rest of the fold, um, which is really important. Um, you know, we've talked about digital software, but I guess, you know, there's two streams. There's that, you know, that sort of project structured systems, IT um, planning, and we call them PRQ Q meeting um, guidelines um, and then there's keeping things as I don't know if normal is the right word but keeping things you know through those usual connections to make the experience less daunting so um, yeah. How's it, how's it been going in and out so we're in lockdown number six now I mean Naomi, I, Naomi had a fabulous Instagram post a while ago where she sort of rated each one and I think number <laughs> four or something was like can't remember and I'm like I can't remember it either I've got no idea what happened but how has it been coming in and out? Has that made it easier or harder, this sort of backwards and forwards? I've been surprised by how quickly we've been able to transition and to make that work. Mm. Um, um, you, you know, we personally as a company, um, one of the first things we did was look at how tech is changing and what we need to be really thinking about. I think we thought pretty early on that this might be the case of, you know, in and out. Um, so we're transitioning away from desktop computers to the kind of like the big gaming computer so that they can manage Revit. Um, and um, while we don't have the full company on that yet, the, the, the chopping and changing um, ha hasn't been as strenuous as, I would have perhaps thought if I'd been, you know, this had been proposed to me before all of this had happened. Um, and, but I think the ongoing, the current that runs through all of this is well-being, which I think we'll probably get to and have a good chat about, um, because it's really about the, what I think in terms of the transition of in and out is the, is the emotional up and downs and how that, that affects our workforce. Um, and how those are the kind of the intangible things that are hard to um, hard to help with as a company, but as a service industry, people are our most important um, commodity. That's not quite the right word. But. That's it. That's it. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You might say the wrong thing there somewhere. Um, so yeah, it's it's got to be about how how our um, our people are experiencing it, and we can't always um, be across all of that. But. Yeah, I'm agreed. And depending on your sort of scale of size of your practice, um, you know, Grimshaw's global, so there's a lot of mobility that used to happen prior to not being able to fly and do things remotely. Well get used to doing things remotely. And so we were lucky that we have a quite a significant IT global team. So um, our IT was, was very, very, very good and robust. And I think the team certainly felt supported through technology and the ability to transition very quickly in terms of that. But as Sarah said, it's understanding people's emotions and not being fully aware of people's personal situations, even their home environments. and 
you know, I don't know, this morning on Radio National, there's a big conversation about home environments and how it has enormous impact on your well-being. But things are becoming more visible, literally, through Zoom, that you can see where people are and sort of what how their working conditions are. I mean, I'm stuck in the office at the moment with a very boring background behind me and the others, you look all very library, so it looks very, very warm and inviting. But I think it is, it is that sort of emotional, you know, spinning so many plates, it's really hard to capture. Um, but I know we'll come down to that, that discussion around wellbeing and... Or maybe we should head to that now. So Naomi, this is your Hang baby. on a second. Just before, I just, I, I'm really curious to know, like in the university sector, of course, we had a mass emergency where we had to take our entire courses online in very, very quick time as well. And, and there's been talk worldwide across the sector about whether that emergency moment, you know, like whether the things that we cobbled together then are the things that have become the new normal and we kind of get sort of stuck maybe with those vestiges. And I'm really interested to know whether in practice you've been able to continually improve things or whether it was the, the emergency measures that were put in place have more or less endured. I think we've actually improved sort of the sort of mixed mode platform interaction, Naomi. I, I think actually it's, there was a kind of, a, I, I guess, because in when Grimshaw was kind of planning the, the, the mobility that happens around Grimshaw, there's always ways to kind of improve and, and um, make things accessible. And I, and I think some of it was Band-Aid, some of it was reactionary, but we're, we're in a good place to try new software and to test it and then to improve on it. And obviously the clients... Um, and you know, demand other other platforms as well. So we're constantly um, engaging in new creative ways to, yeah, in terms of digital platforms in that sense. So I think it's been, I think it's allowed us to improve. Mm. I guess, I mean, another way of asking my question is, do you think you're responding to pandemic conditions better now than you were in March last year? Mm, that's a good yeah. oh. I would, I would say yes. Yeah. Um, you know, once you've been hit with a shock, you kind of get rid of that, you know. Um, you don't want to be surprised again. So um, I, I would say generally yes. Mm. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> um, all right, let's move on to the well-being topic. Um, and indeed, the reason why I'm asking this question is because, as many of you probably know, I've been uh, working on a collaborative research project which addresses work-related well-being in architecture. And we've just closed our major industry survey, which had more than 2,000 responses, in fact, more than 2,200 responses. So thank you very much to everybody in this group who completed the survey. So can you tell us, um, Sarah and Tiwa, about strategies? What strategies did you have to look after yourselves and your colleagues um, during this period? Mm. Um, well, I would say, you know, once again, um, uh, the, the attempt to over communicate where the company was at, because at the, at the very start, um, when the university projects were starting to fall by the wayside, and we just didn't know what was ahead of us. Primarily, the first thing that came up as a company um, from from where I was sat was health, because there was a big concern about what is this germ? What, how is how are we protecting people? You know, um, in terms of sanitization, um, and then all of a sudden, like literally within a week, it was oh, these jobs are cancelled and these jobs are cancelled, and it immediately became job security. Okay, how do we? How do we make sure, once again, we don't know what's going to be happening next week, next month. How do we make sure people have still got jobs? Because it felt a little bit, it felt a bit, uh, bit cataclysmic, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it felt like what was happening was bigger than us. So um, job security was a really big focus. We did um, momentarily, well, period of time, have to reduce everyone's days. We're a company of, of we're currently 35, but we're a company that sits around that size. So um, we, you know, we're not the expand and contract type company. We wanted to look after everybody. Um, and um, I think I've gone off track from your question. Oh, well, um, well tell us, was there anything about, um, what did you find effective in terms of looking after your people and yourselves? And was there anything that surprised you? Yeah, I loved the way everyone looked after each other as well. Like um, there were these, it, you know, um, Slack was used for connection. And there was like, we had confinement cuisine. We had um, desert island tracks where people would put their favourite music tracks. 
Um, we've got an ISO watching channel, you know, to recommend you. <laughs> you know, things like that where um, we had a team of um, women working on a, um, a project in Bendigo that were just so good at looking after each other. They had this sort of... Um, um, you know, morning tea kind of, you know, regular, just just immense support that people were showing each other outside of anything that the company could have done um, was really, really heartening. I don't know if it was surprising, but it was really heartening. Um, yeah. And I think carried through. No, I mean, I, I, and I think in terms of, you know, we're all catapulted in situation and I think one of the, Maybe it's a sadder thing rather than a surprising thing, but when we, you know, all have our sort of Zoom meetings and we have our Friday at fives where people, you know, can share what they'd like to. And I remember one of the one of my colleagues said, "Oh, she lived at home and didn't have anyone to talk to." And of course, my phone, you know, started ringing because I was like, "How are we going to help her?" and things like that. And but we actually we got, you know, a lot of practices are got a lot of international people working for us and unable to return home because of borders and to get back into the country and don't have that sort of network and family and friends. And what we actually did is had a roster, um, all buddy system, where people met up with um, their colleagues within the, the, the all, you know, complying with all the restrictions and walked around the park. And that was, that was really, you know, we made a lot more connections that way. And we, you know, I found out a lot more about a couple of, you know, the my colleagues here and, um, that's what's been really great is that you have actually been able to form new friendships through different sort of um, ways of doing things. And I, I think there's a, a couple of things about well-being, of course, and there's those sort of little interactional moments, those little sort of moments that you create opportunities. And certainly here we've really made an extra effort for people to reach out to other people. Um, and, you know, of course, Sarah and I probably have a long list of staff and certain information, but we've really try to ensure that people aren't left alone outside during work but also you know on the weekends and you know is that dipping into sort of territory not meant to I don't know but I think in this kind of space at the moment people are being really grateful that their phone rings ringing or they'll be able to go down the street and get takeaway and walk around the block together and those small little gestures just go such a long way um, but also just kind of from a more kind of I guess formal strategy um, I know a lot of companies on this call here have EAPs um, because we're not, well, I'm not a trained counsellor and certainly, you know, you've got to be careful about the advice you give, but we can always point people to our employment system program, which utilisation is, is on track, if we can call it that, or what we predicted. Um, but I think it's not just having the EAP that sits on your intranet and sits in the cupboard. It's actually about the promotion, you know, of health and wellbeing and creating a safe space for people to talk about it. And certainly um, the partners here, every practice touch point for the studio, they remind people about um, the EAP and what it offers, not just say it's there, go and look at the numbers. They actually talk about why it's important. Um, and they also make themselves available as well. Um, and I've just lost my train of thought, but it's, we also, um, we have a lot of, um, we have also working groups and probably many of you are familiar with Champions of Change and sort of the work streams that have come out of, of those and we've certainly formed our own internal working groups that are separate but some of the conversations more elevated around mental health and wellbeing, around parental and family friendly places, around sexual harassment, bullying, all those sort of topics or, or, or working groups that are really important to keep people included, to keep the workforce interested, to keep the conversation diverse. So that sense of belonging, I guess, if you feel like you're informed or you are able to participate and influence decision making at whichever level, um, we, we hope that, you know, shows a commitment to your, you know, that you're able to participate and you're interested not just in, in one area of the practice, but the broader community. So I think that goes a lot to health and well-being. Um, we also have um, a funded. Um, sorry, all the chats are coming up on the side of my screen. We also have um, a paired mentoring program, um, which I'm sure a lot of you have as well, um, and that's funded. So I think that's a good thing to have as well. We have group mentoring and we kind of stole that, I think, from Woods Baggett in the last call, um, which has proved to be really excellent. We had 99% of people attend the group mentoring and we have offices in other, in other states and also 
um, the Melbourne office has um, projects in New Zealand, so we're able to bring them into the fold, even though they're going through something very different. Um, but a lot of those people are from our other overseas studios. So again, they are going through in, during their own experience of not being able to connect with their families and give them a big hug. Um, we also, um, you know, through, we're doing, and you probably all do this, but sort of coffee catch-ups. Um, we fund that as well. And we're doing that over Zoom um, as well as um, face-to-face -face as much as possible. And we're also kind of pulling people's names out of hats. So you would be paired with someone you normally wouldn't necessarily work with. Um, and that's that's proven to be really great. And we're getting people, if you want, again, we don't want to force things on people, but if you take a happy snap and get a sort of a, you know, a Pinterest board together when we have sort of socials and present that. So we're trying to, you know, I'm not in communications at all, but we're trying to, you know, elevate, I guess, a level of energy and, and um, collaboration, not just through projects, but through the connection, through the social aspects um, of the team. I wonder if we might, um, Emma Healy has made an excellent, um, let's say, proposition, which is also a question. Emma, do you want to say that aloud? Sure. Um, I actually think the TY's explanation goes against what I was suggesting, but um, I thought it might be easier for smaller practices to stay in touch with their workforces and therefore know the emotional status of their employees a little bit easier, but I have found working in a smaller practice, the technology costs and things like that have been um, harder to grapple with, um, with working remotely. So I wondered if Sarah Tiwa had an opinion on that or anyone else? Um, in, in terms of the smaller practices, you're saying that, that the tech is, is, is not really conducive to uh, sorry, can you can you explain that a bit, Emma? Uh, I was just thinking about, like, for example, Miro. I know Miro is a really good, awesome program for collaborating on, but um, probably costs a bit more than um, some of the smaller practices or sole practitioners, well, not sole practitioners, that small people would be able to afford to use, as an example. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's definitely a scalable differences for smaller to larger firms. Um, um, what TY has been listing is is fantastically gold standard, and it's it's um, it's definitely within matching the the size and the the the, the back end support that Grimshaw has available to do that, and they do it very very well. Um, smaller practices aren't necessarily going to have that um, the, the the ability or the financial you know um, ability. But there are, I mean, I would, I would point to, you know, the Zooms and the Slacks and the, to be honest, I'm not familiar with Miro. Um, so um, it's not, it's not something that we're using. I don't know if there's anyone from Six Degrees, you might say to me, actually, Sarah, we are. <laughs> Tiwar, I've just got a question quickly. You were talking about the, you know, that raft of initiatives, which is, you know, sounds as, as um, Sarah said, gold standard, but you mentioned a few times that these things were funded. Does that mean that you're paying people, you know, that people are not having to do this in their own time, that this part of, it's understood as part of their job, that the mentoring and the coffee catch-ups, or, or what do you mean when you say they're funded? So when I say it's funded, so people don't just have to stay in the office, they can go out and buy a coffee um, or a lunch. So when I say funded, sorry, it's not a massive amount of money at all. It's sort of, you know, you can expense, you know, a small lunch or, or, a, or a morning tea or something like that. So I think it is to, well, it is to encourage people to um, feel like that they, they can do it on, on work time and that it is, we are compensating for it in some way. So is it a bit of a lure or, you know, yes, it is. But I think it's very worthwhile if, if you can afford it. Mm. Um, but not saying it can't happen without funding. Um, I think, you know, these, these programs are global. So, you know, they have a start and end date, but we, and then we start the cycle again. But I think it's, you know, I've always advocated that mentoring should always just be ongoing. You know, there's different types of mentoring, um, but it should happen anyway. And it's not necessarily from leaders to the younger staff. I think the saying is if you don't have a mentor under 30, then you, you haven't lived properly. And <laughs> I didn't realise people under 30 still existed. But um, I, I do have one and I think it's incredibly valuable. But sorry to answer your question, Justine, it is there because we realise people want to step out or actually do on their lunch break. So how can we support that? Mm. Um, so it's sending a pretty clear message that it's part of the company culture. Yes, even. yes, yes, correct, yes. Mm. 
Sarah, did you um did you want to add anything about um you know sort of strategies for looking after you the well being of your people and yourself? Um. Uh, well, there's so much. Um, um, we, you know, we like, we have an eat program. Of course, I think that's a really important resource to to draw on if you're wanting to have your own your own private um, um, support. Um, and as I say, the the kind of the connective collegiate stuff that the uh, groups working together. But also, I would say, um, leadership being vulnerable is really important. And um, you know, something um, to answer a bit broad, more broadly your question, Naomi, about other surprises that have come out of these last 18 months. One is just the amount of, um, you know, nobody's having holidays. We're, we're kind of skipping holidays. There's a, there's a new, I mean, people at Six Degrees have heard me say this a bit recently. Um, you know, we do equate holidays with, well, I have to go somewhere and largely we try and book somewhere and then we have to cancel or we just think, well, I can't go anywhere, so I won't take a break. But our mental health needs a break. And um, and so, uh, you know, I've, I've been saying recently, I took a week off recently and I did nothing. I just did puzzles and I read and it was incredibly important. Um, um, I couldn't, I couldn't, didn't realise until I'd done it how important it was for me to be able to keep doing my job for the company properly and I would say that was that would be true of everyone so personally I meditate I um I try and do exercise and eat well and um and I don't say that just to talk about me I say that to say we're not robots (laughs) it's not easy and um and we should just sort of allow and 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 um accept and and support people in their vulnerabilities because there's homeschooling there's people living on their own there's um people living in relationships that are difficult and and contentious there's there is so much in the confinement that we've been experiencing that goes beyond our work practices but it's so merged with our work practices because it's been very hard for people to um define boundaries and the you know checking in on your emails at ten o'clock at night sort of becomes a, a somewhat accepted practice, and it shouldn't be. Um, so um, there's, in terms of the eighteen months and the light at the end of the tunnel, the things that I think we need to learn are about our vulnerabilities in our relationship with our work, and about how we, um, how can we work healthier, not harder. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's, there's not a clear answer to that, but I just think that's probably one of the most important things that is naturally rising in this this period of time we're in. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. think so, Sarah. I mean, one of the things that, you know, is constantly occupying me is how to deal with, you know, the legitimate sort of anxiety of people, including myself, and sometimes we've got to keep our behaviours in check because, you know, we're under enormous amounts of stress and... I can see the sort of chats and Emma put a, a great message in there about, you know, a clear message about clocking off at the end of the day. And, you know, I, I wish I could and I've got to actually be better at that. And, you know, part of the things I struggle with is with the global practice and you've got London that wakes up and then New York that wakes up or maybe it's the other way around. And it's some, you know, I have to sometimes put my phone in another room and shut the door just so I don't get tempted to look at it. Um, and I've become more wary now of sending emails out at night because I know sometimes the way I work, you really get to your emails and then you sit on your couch and you sort of can go through them without interruption. But I've, I'm going to stop doing that because I think we need to have good role models as well. And I think that's sort of, you know, I can't speak on the behalf of the partners, but it's sort of genuine and ethical leadership, you know, about understanding people's differences is really, really important. Um, You know, to Sarah's point, and I think I mentioned before, but to keep myself sort of sane, and obviously with restrictions, you can't go and whack a ball around necessarily inside, but I certainly try and keep up my sporting commitments. Um, I, you know, thought I was an Olympian the last two weeks, but now that's stopped. Um, Mm -hmm. But we've got the Paralympics coming up, which I'm very excited about. But um, I certainly... I love to hit cricket balls, so that's what I do. I tend to go and just whack it in the net, and that's how I that's how I unwind because I'm 
this, you know, I can't have my phone, I can't wear my watch, it says messages, because if the ball hits it, it breaks. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, but that's certainly how I completely detach. Um, yeah, so, but I, th I, yeah, it is really tricky. And I, I think the le I'm kind of highly anxious person, you probably gathered that. And I hope I don't show that when I'm in conversations with team members. But, um, you know, I was reading some, you know, a speech that Jacinta Ardern gave the other day, just around about kindness and, and the Indigenous peoples of New Zealand. And then, you know, we look at the sort of the language, the statement of the heart in the Uluru statement, um, has and then we I don't know if any of you know of Hugh McKay's Kindness of the Heart book but you know hopefully we can use those threads of, of messaging and kindness in our conversations um, with our team members to look after each other and 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 ourselves because I think to Sarah's point we caught up last night but you know a lot of things we we kind of uh, exposed to or or because everyone's sort of working their own way and then we get everything from everybody. So it's trying to, how do you manage that? You know, how do you protect yourself because you want to protect others? So um, it, it can be complex, but I think that I guess it's that keep being connected, keep talking about it. And you don't always have the, I don't ever have the right answer. And I'm sure I frustrate a lot of people in the studio. Um, but I think it's just to recognise that we're all, we're all human in the end. Um, I've just had a question come in um, from someone who doesn't want to pose it themselves, but I think it's quite an important question. Um, so, which is how do you deal with employees that disregard the men mental health, fair salaries and violate um, their colleagues' privacy? Um, so, uh, you know, this is kind of the pointier end, isn't it? How do you, how do you manage um, those who are not looking after their colleagues' mental health? Um, um, it, it, part of me, my first instinct is wanted to, to want to understand more about the context of that. But um, the the best way is really to make that known to someone like Tiwara or myself or, or whoever's in HR um, and, um, and to ask that something is done about that. Um, it's not unfamiliar to me um, that that does come up. So if I'm understanding that correctly, it is people who, in terms of their anxiety on whatever project, may overload the team with that anxiety and expect more from the team that is fair. Um, and that issue sits with the person who's doing that. So unless we know about that, we can't act on it. And if we do know about that, then it takes a lot of care to act on that, a lot of carefulness to act on that appropriately so that whatever actions you take to correct that issue, it makes it back to the team that's experiencing it. It's corrected and felt by the team that it's being corrected but then there's an, 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 a great deal of um, careful treading <laughs> that has to happen so that there's not, it's, it's not, the issue isn't dealt with as an explosion. It's dealt with a, as a um, considered long-term fix. It's, it's a hard one to talk to directly, but yes, it does happen. When people are in a state of stress, um, they can unconsciously share that stress rather than, you know, it, sometimes these times expect us all to be pure heroes that don't have any background or don't bring any of their own, you know, um, systemic issues to the table, and they do. Um, I think that's right, Sarah. I think that, you know, we don't, not everyone knows what's going on. There might be what I call Radio Grimshaw, uh, the chatter that happens around, but, you know, It'd be, you know, understand the context of that of that question, Justine, because it sounds quite serious to me in that mm. sense. But um, I think, and I'm not sure about everyone else, but on our my meeting agendas it might sound very dry, but there's always an agenda point of, of health and well-being. So we actually try and capture anything that may have been said off the cuff or emails being sent to someone else about someone else that somehow cycle back to someone knowing about something, but unless we do know about it, we cannot act. And that's the other thing. And if we do see something, it is up to us to engage the leadership, the partners or whoever is making those decisions, they need to know. I mean, there's obviously levels of confidentiality that we don't share everything, but they need to know something is happening and how we correct it and how we do it 
with kindness, with sensitivity, but there is an outcome at the end of it um, that we haven't ignored it. And, you know, some things fall under the rug. There is no doubt about that. But if we don't know about it in the first instance, then we don't know about it. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we might go to the question from Claire. Um, Claire, do you want to put your question? Yeah, I just, I guess coming from an employee's point of view, I'd be interested to know how your employees have responded to a lot of the wellbeing measures. Like we're in this constant feedback loop with our management about deadlines and how we're feeling and if we feel we need more time and why, especially if something is happening at home that maybe they don't know about. Um, so how our employees have responded to these measures, um, I'm going to say it's varied and I'm going to say that there are certain, um, to answer that holistically, I'd, I'd need to know that I'm answering on behalf of all our employees and um, there may be some things that I'm not aware of, um, but... I do know that we uh, we do what we can to have regular conversations, not not just with me, but other people in the company regularly conversing with each other that I invariably hear about. Um, so, I I would I would have to answer that by saying I would hope that there is some kind of consciousness um, for our employees that 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 there's an awareness, I should say, that um, we're trying to listen and we're trying to make changes where required if it's, um, if it's resourcing, if it's um, um, deadline pushing. Um, it's, it's, a hard, it's a hard one to answer because I know while I'm saying it, the world pushes really hard against us sometimes. And, you know, um, I think something that also happens, has happened in this pandemic is there's been a, sorry to go off just for a moment, but it, it does somewhat come back to what you're asking, um, where the economy has been under save, saving mode. So the, the government has, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of multi-residential housing, there's lots of, lots of work coming in and the deadlines are really hard and fast. So it's putting, it's applying another level of pressure onto an already pressured industry um, and to make, let's put us, let's put, let's put the government here and then the company here and let's put management here. For us to fix that in every way is really quite hard because we're getting pushed, <laughs> if, <it> makes, <laughs> if that makes sense. So for the people who are being directly impacted by those pressures, I would say they're probably not all feeling that it's all being fixed. <laughs> um, I, I would say if they can at least know that we're trying, that's 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 sometimes the best we can do. Um, we also have one more other pressure that Tiwa and I were talking about last night, which is that we don't have immigration at the moment and there are not many people available to help do the work. We're aware, for example, that we, um, we're under-resourced and... Um, um, there's not there's there's a bit of a drought at the moment of available architects. Yeah. So sorry, I don't think that answered your question properly, Claire. But um, Tiwa might do a better job. No, not at all, not at all. And I'm trying to read in between the lines of all of that. But I, I think that that's right. There are enormous pressures coming from up here, and we're here, and we're trying to kind of balance that. What, and you know, so you raised a really good point because I mean, in, in terms about resourcing, actually, because I think we're all kind of understanding the the, the, the trickiness of that space and the pressure that puts on on um, on our projects and on individuals. Um, in terms of people responding to the measures we put in place, I mean, we put out a lot of surveys, and I know surveys. Sorry, no, we don't necessarily capture everything, mm. um, but they certainly give a kind of a you know, a snapshot. And I, and I think that um, people are responding, you know, in varied ways, um, depending on their needs. But certainly there's, we've scored highly on the fact that the part or well, the leaders are promoting health and well-being. They're always talking about it. Um, and I think that's really important. But in terms of responding to your question exactly, Claire, it, it is really tricky. And I we've got teams at the moment that are working extremely long hours and we need to be better at it and it's really hard to manage um, of course you can do things through the formal ways like you know toil and things like that but 
how do you stop that from happening all the time, these long hours? And I think the whole industry grapples with it. Um, I certainly don't have a, you know, a gold medal or a, you know, a magic bullet to solve that issue. And I, I think it's really hard. It's very tricky to, to try and manage individuals. But I think if we have really good leaders or leaders of that project, it's the way they manage their teams as well. It's the way they are supported to manage their teams to say, we are going to have these push and pull areas or these push and pull times, but let's put a time frame around it. Let's not just say they're going to happen. They actually review it after a month, you know, make sure you have those checkpoints because some people will be more able to do more work, you know, more hours. Some people mightn't. Some, and we, of course, we don't want to push long hours cultures onto people, but it does exist. And as an industry, we are constantly grappling with it. And I think you go up to what are the fees, you know, sort of stems down from there. Yeah, I agree with that. It does. We get so affected by the fees because fees would equate to more time. But, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, in, in, a, in a sense. But I would say just a really interesting thing that, you know, once again, I have no answer to this, but what I'm finding interesting that has been coming up a little bit is, um, it's a whole other subject, is that understandably um, employees are starting to try and look for different ways of working. Um, you know, the, the, the five day in a four day, five days in a four day week or the nine day fortnight or, and it's actually a very, very, and you know, we're not the only company that's had that request. It's a very difficult um, one to respond to and to get right simply because and it's a very understandable one that comes up because people are trying to work out how can I make my work-life balance better how can I not be working under these conditions um, and the ramifications of that might have effects on other people in the team if we have a whole company working in different structured well that person's not available that's making me have to do a late night and there's a Tetris that's that's not a, not an easy fix, but I'm really open to hearing about those questions because where do we go? It's sort of like um, where where do we go with fixing this? And um, um, I don't know. I guess you know if we were all given great fees and longer deadlines, life would be different. <laughs> Well, you might be interested to know, Sarah, and indeed everyone, that um, I had a very preliminary look at the results from the wellbeing survey yesterday. And um, to, in answer to the question, if there was one thing that you could do to improve work-related wellbeing in the profession, what would it be? A surprising number of people said increased fees. So, and it's not about self-care or mm. it's about fees. It's about money, which means time, as you have said. Mm. Um, Justine, we've got eight minutes left. What do you want to do? So many, so much, so many good comments in the um, in the questions. A lot of people simply offering, you know, sort of ex sharing their experiences, which is really great. Um, I am interested, um, Naomi, if you want to cherry pick some questions, that would be great. I'm also just interested in how things are now, as compared to, you know, I guess when this all started, everyone was really, really worried about. Um, work pipelines that it just felt like it was about to go off a cliff. Now I can't open my Instagram without seeing advertisements for someone, you know, we're hiring, we're hiring, everyone's hiring. And you've already spoken a little bit about how it's hard to find people, but it does feel like the kind of, um, you know, I suppose to build on that conversation about fees, it feels like the economic outlook is quite different now than people were fearing it would be where there was a sense that everything was about to go off a cliff and, you know, we were back to architects, you know, driving taxis or uber or whatever um not that that's a bad thing <laughs> but, but um i just i'm interested to know um how things have shifted in that in those terms and what what that kind of might mean yeah it's a very interesting very complex and slightly <laughs> distorted distorted sort of phase we're in it was like there was a dearth and now there's a flood mm. not quite the right words and the um there's catch up that comes with all the extra work. So there was sort of like a, there was an economic hole that's getting filled. And now there's, so it's, it's, um, which is fantastic. But I would say the biggest thing at the moment is the unavailability of human beings. <laughs> um, it's, I find it quite concerning at the moment to be, to be honest, because, um, um, yeah, they just they just aren't the people. Every other day, I'm getting an email saying we're looking for someone. Do you guys know of anyone? Do you you know? And um, 
it's, it's quite a, a critical issue for the industry. I mean, it's kind of, I was speaking to someone the other day, uh, runs another practice. We're in a perfect storm at the moment um, for being truly tested. A lot of work, not enough people, an exhausted workforce. Um, and that's sort of where we at, we're at, hopefully three quarters or closer to the end of the tunnel because the the economic addition should be a beautiful light at the end of the tunnel and it's actually not quite there. <laughs> like a... I think so. Oh, sorry, I probably... I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you know, finding talent is obviously very hard at the moment or, you know, the, the resource out there and that's also because of all the not able other people, for overseas people coming to the country as well. And we've certainly got people here that are returning to their country simply because most of their time in Melbourne has been in lockdown. So may as well be in lockdown with my family. Um, I think not only is finding talent hard, but retaining talent is probably, you know, what we should also be thinking about as well. Um, I think that's a huge hurdle because there's so much opportunity out there and you've already invested in growing people within your own practice. So you want to, you want to see their career and, you know, grow as well so we I, yeah i think that's really important to mention is that retaining talent um in this hybrid workplace at the moment um and is that is other people you're looking for sort of ex experienced practitioners because i think one of the other things that came up again and again all of last year at our events was um real concern from students and recent graduates about how on earth they were ever going to get a foot in the door how they were going to learn how they were going to you know there's so much learning as by osmosis and simply being around teams and within teams um and how do you think things are going for the for the younger younger ones obviously working remotely can be a challenge for them to you know, get that learning by osmosis, which was what was so lovely about being able to get back into the office. Mm. Um, uh, Tim, you've got to... <laughs> I mean, we, you know, it's interesting because you obviously, you know, when you look at your kind of your, your shape and size and you have, you know, senior people that, you know, work on projects, but, and then you have, I guess not everyone's on the tools, not senior people can are on the tools, of course, but you you know, we're finding a bigger space for, for younger graduates at the moment because they're on a lot of revenue generating projects. They can hop in and, and move around very quickly. Um, so we're actually finding that space for us is, we're hoping that that's providing more opportunity for graduates at the moment, what we're going through. But I think, we, I think we're all also, you know, that sort of mid-level project architect that, you know, can work on all phases of the projects and can, you know, open up a Revit model and understand all the 3,000 clash detections um, and, you know, managing complex project teams and, and you know, they are, there are far and few between. Mm. Uh, but it's, yeah, it is a complex space. Mm. I mean, certainly just even through the, um, you know, even during the lockdowns and some practice had people they weren't able to allocate work to. So certainly I, I think in this group we, we're probably aware of, um, we try to do as many comments as possible and, and, and things like that to help support the industry and support each other and then bring those people back. So that was, I guess, a mechanism through lockdown. And now that was to try and keep them and retain them because they were, you know, excellent talent. You, you know, became a sort of a, yeah, everyone was really good. And now we're looking at, you know, what we need to do to support the projects that are coming on board. And it's a better place to be in than the other way around. So that's, at some light. Mm. I, can, I can just, I just want to, I know we're sort of winding up and I just wanted to comment. I saw that comment from Leith Schmid. Um, I know uh, young people very disillusioned want to leave the industry. Mm. That's heartbreaking. Um, and I'm, you know, it's really, really sad to hear that. And I hope we can change that somehow because, um, you know, it, it is a good industry when it's not under these pressures. We do good work. We make a difference to the, 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 the city, the country. And it's the, you know, the talent of people who are passionate about architecture that we need. We don't want them dropping off. So um, um, I guess T.Y. and I, when we chatted last night, we said let's be really careful about not, just focusing on on the problems at the moment and i think we naturally it's hard not to gravitate towards that but it's good that the title of this talk is light at the end of the tunnel because there simply has to be light at the end of the tunnel the, mm -hmm. humans come through difficult things and we will come through this and um 
it, it's just, you know, we'll come through it with good things like, um, you know, more better work-life balance, um, people being able to work remotely so they can go and stay with their family overseas but still work for the company. Um, there, there are positives. I just wanted to sneak that in because it's so hard to not um, acknowledge some of the good that is no, there. Absolutely, Sarah, and I think it is. It's incredibly daunting and certainly through the earlier phases of the, of the lockdowns, there was this, what's going to be at the end of my studies? How am I going to find a job? How am I actually going to be able to attend practices, do internships, do work experience when we're working remotely? And it was, it, it's still daunting. But I think as Sarah said, it will get better. It has to get better. It has to shift. And we're probably much more equipped to understand those nuances. Um, I also think it's even starts before university. I mean, even you think of the secondary school students that, you know, do, do their placements and how they do that with such a, you know, we're stuck in sort of regular, reg, I can't pronounce that word, but a, a space where we so have to comply with so many things. The schools want the school students to be in spaces where, you know, they don't know their COVID safe plans and all of that. But I, I think that's how I'm also trying to reach out to the broader community. And I sat on a call the other day with a group of secondary school students and um, I asked a few colleagues to help join the session and mentor them and ask questions. So that was their work. You know, we're doing sort of regular monthly catch up with these students. So they feel like there's some foot in the door or some exposure to the industry or how they start to make their choices as they enter the business end of their schooling. But um I do think it's, you know, there's a lots of student forums out there um, and I hopefully encourage students and graduates to get involved because it's these conversations, these networking um, forums that will also help or hopefully give people more confidence to reach out and for someone also to pay attention and to stop for a moment and, and listen to them. Um, and I know... And um, certainly, Sarah, you probably receive a lot of CVs, a lot of student inquiries. So it's something that we have to, you know, sort of paying it forward, actually stop and, and respond. I think that's the thing is respond, you know, connect with them. Mm. So, yeah. I mean, there are such a lot of great observations and, in fact, great questions that we didn't get to in the chat. And um, we've had people talking about the effects on parents engaging uh, homeschooling at the same time they've been trying to work. There's been talk about uh, punctuation points at the beginning and the end of the day, so it doesn't just become one 24-hour long, undifferentiated tunnel. Um, opportunities for young staff, but also challenges for young staff. So there's many things that we could have talked about that we unfortunately haven't got to. Um, do you want to wrap it up, Justine? Sure. Um, yes, there's lots and lots. I've got so many more questions I want to ask, but um, we are actually going to continue with this topic in two weeks' time, um, and we have uh, two speakers who are going to be with us then, uh, Ilana Razbash and Sue Wittenoom, who um, have both been really, really key regulars um, as audience um, members and also as um, participants and as co-chairs last year. So we thought we'd sort of pull them back in for a conversation um, which we hope you can, you'll also all come to and, and we can continue some of this discussion that we might not have got to today. But I'd just like to thank Sarah and Tiwa very much. It was a very generous conversation. Um, uh, we're very privileged, I think, to be able to uh, participate in, in a conversation between you two. I know you are in touch really regularly, so we're really very honoured and um, thankful that you'd agreed to do it on camera with us. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, you guys at Parlour, because um, when I think about the last 18 months, I do, Parlour is, you know, quite high up there in terms of the support that our company has enjoyed. And um, you've really, I've had people say, oh, I went to this Parlour talk. It was so good. So thank you for the connectivity that you guys have provided the industry to. Well, thank yeah, you, Sarah. I have to, I have to absolutely thank Parlour because certainly it elevates conversations within our practice, but um it's certainly been a huge support. And um, I will shout out to Catherine too from ACA because mm. they've been incredible as well. Um, there are quite a few forums that I join there in terms of mental health and wellbeing. So um, I, I, I appreciate the support um, and I know the practice appreciates support of Parlour as well. Well, that's a very lovely note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the other thing I should say is next Friday, we've got our Parlour Lab session, which is the sort of the research 
sharing sessions and that's going to be on post-occupancy evaluation which I think will also be very interesting so book in for that one book in for us next week and then if we have um, a secret surprise new series that we'll be launching actually we've got two um, so keep an eye on your email and your social media and we have lots more planned so thank you Thanks, Maybe. everyone, for coming. So nice to see you all. Hey, and I should tell you, this is a silly little anecdote, but I was talking to someone yesterday, a person, who is acquainted with another person who uh, was unfortunately in prison during part of the pandemic and apparently got double time for being in prison during that period. Like, as in, the sentence was chopped in half. So bear what? that in mind. It's like one hey. times two. Hey, <laughs> double time is what you're all doing right now. <laughs> 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 thanks everyone very nice to see you all it really is we have a lovely Thank friday you. afternoon we'll see you soon